So this is the role uh, and place of emotional intelligence in initial teacher education, a comparative study between two countries. And Dr. Calardo finished her master in TESOL and doctoral study at Monash University, Australia. And as a teacher of English, she has worked in a variety of contexts teaching English as a second language in both Chile and internationally. And her PhD research explored the identification, understanding, and knowledge of emotional intelligence skills in pre-surface teacher education. She, she is currently working as a lecturer in the Monash Intercultural Lab. So, uh, Bapak dan Ibu, uh, topiknya mungkin uh, penelitiannya, experience-nya ada di konteks bahasa, tapi saya rasa dari keseluruhan tentang how doing the research and publication, ya, ini sangat cocok untuk semua bidang yang ada di program studi pasca sarjana kita. Okay, so the first part we will have a talk, uh, Dr. Gallardo will, will sharing uh, the PPT and then uh, giving us about the content of the the session today and then we it, it is will followed by the question and answer after that and then uh, the session will take around one hour to one hour and a half so Dr. Gallardo the floor the floor is yours thank you for the nice introduction hello everyone it's very nice to you uh, to be here today, uh, live streaming from Australia, from Melbourne, and uh, thank you for inviting me. It's such an honor to, um, to be presenting at this university for the first time, so I'm quite excited. Um, as, um, as it was mentioned, my name is Marcela, just call me Marcela, that's fine, and my research is mainly about um, emotional intelligence in initial teacher education. And uh, I did a comparative study uh, by publication. So before I begin, I would like to quickly introduce myself. You already mentioned uh, quite a few things, but I'll summarize it nicely so you get to understand uh, and to know me a bit better. If you need to use the chat at any time, please do so. You can ask questions there. Uh, I'll have it next to me, so I'll be responding in case you want to ask anything. And if I'm talking to you fast, just let me know and I can slow down um, so you can understand what I'm saying. And um, I'm, uh, my background is um, English as a second language, so I studied uh, English teaching uh, or ESL in Chile. So I'm originally from South America, uh, but I came to Australia in 2015 to do my masters of diesel. And then as if that wasn't enough, I decided to complete a PhD in education, which finished in July. And I couldn't be happier. <laughs> uh, that, that chapter is finally over. I'm currently working as a lecturer as part of the Monash Intercultural Lab. So here I teach two units, which are about intercultural competence, how to train or teach students about cultural difference and intercultural intelligence. So it's a bit related to what I did in my studies, uh, but a little bit different in terms of all these new concepts about multiculturalism and um, intercultural difference. All right, so that's a little bit about me. Um, what we'll do today, and hopefully it won't get too boring for you, just ask any questions as you like as I'm talking, that's fine, you can interrupt me. It gets actually more fun, so I don't feel like I'm talking alone all the time. Uh, I'll be quickly, quickly summarizing and understanding what I mean by uh, emotional intelligence. And I don't know if you are familiar with the concept, but I'll quickly summarize it so you get to understand um, what I mean by that. And I'll quickly present a poster that I uh, just created um, and I presented it at the European Educational Research Association in 2021. Uh, it's quite detailed and don't freak out if it's 
got too much information. I'll try to summarize it as nice and simple as I can. So it's, you know, uh, easy to understand. And finally, I'll be talking very briefly about how is to study overseas. And I'm sure here is to the bit where most of you, hopefully most of you are interested. Um, I don't know who wants to study overseas sometime or if you're thinking about doing further studies. Um, so I'll quickly tell you and talk about my, my experience. And finally, how is to complete a PhD by publication, which is, the format that uh, that <laughs> Ami and I decided to to follow <laughs> the curvy way. Um, all right, so let's get started. Are you ready? Can you give me a reaction to see if ready, you're all there? Yes, we are ready, Miss. Yes, yes. Go on. Ready, oh, means. you great. <laughs> Very good students, <laughs> but you are amusing yourself. Great. Okay, so. Emotional intelligence is very well known. I think we all have heard about this terminology at some point, uh, but I decided to grab and um, take the concept into teacher education. So um, basically how teachers can promote and how can they improve their emotional uh, competence uh and um how is that affecting their teaching practice and how can they um manage their own emotions so in general emotional intelligence is the ability to you know manage and sustain and control emotions uh in oneself and in others um but this concept also includes emotional literacy emotional competence which relates to the personal and uh different con context as well so you know that teachers and i don't know who here is doing or is coming from a teacher teaching background um but i know i mean you do with early childhood uh, kid um so you know that teachers experience a range of emotions in their profession you know happy emotions emotions of joy and excitement but you know that it's also challenging right it, it can get really tricky and it is really important that uh, we are able to recognize and to manage and regulate our emotions when we get those into those tricky situations so uh, in general, uh, research suggests that teachers with higher level of emotional intelligence are more able to recognize and reappraise their emotion, turning negative emotions into positive emotions. All right. Uh, so taking all these concepts into account, I, I will present a very kind of I'll try to make it look nice, but it's uh, um, a snapshot of what I did in my PhD and that I presented through a poster, which looks like this. It might look tiny, but if you want me to share it with you, I can do so later on. Um, hopefully you'll get to see the screen and follow where I'm going. But basically here, what I did in this poster is to summarize 82,000 words that I wrote in my PhD, which was about the role and place of emotional intelligence in initial teacher education. And I compared these in two countries, Chile and Australia. Two very different countries, uh, but I wanted to see um, what was the difference there because obviously my, my background is uh, South American and I'm doing the study, I was doing the study here. Uh, so I already explained about the theory. It's about, you know, the ability to manage emotions, et cetera, et cetera. And we understand that it, there's a need um, to uh, add policies and to have more um, strategies and skills in, in, in pre-service teachers. Um, so for that reason, I decided to investigate about um, how is this concept, how is emotional intelligence or construct, whatever you want to call it, understood, mm -hmm. enacted and embedded yeah. in initial teacher education. Oh. 
And um, mm. if you can um, mute the ones who are, yeah, great, thanks. Because I thought they want, they want to ask something <laughs> and they just keep stopping. So in case they want to say something. So yeah, I wanted to in, um, investigate and to see how these two countries can be compared or not. So the methodology that I used, it's a potpourri of methods. <laughs> So I used um, as in the epistemology, I used a contractive, contractionism, and uh, I used um, multi-method approach. So I mixed qualitative and quantitative methods together. Um, I used three main methodologies, which are autoethnography, case study, and survey methodology. So basically what I did all of the data that I collected in my research, I divided into findings um, chapters. So each of the chapters that I, I mean, the finding chapters, I converted them into publications. Okay, so here I used online survey, which I collected data from both countries and I compared those two using SPSS. Um, I did thematical analysis. I did IPA as well, so interpretive phenomenological analysis. Um, and the participants were 200 students from first and fourth year students in Australia, 109 from Chile, same first and fourth year students. And um, I interviewed just two a very important um, we call them course leaders to see um, they were kind of in charge of um, designing the degree. So I wanted to ask them where and how they think this concept can be incorporated. Okay, so the final and the most important findings are the following. So um, after I carefully analyzed all the data, of course, I um, found out that three main themes merged. They are in the circle, they are in yellow, blue, and orange. So the three uh, main themes um, were about the importance of emotional intelligence in initial teacher education. So why they think the topic is important, how they can learn more about it. And they all agree that it's a very important topic that they want to learn, they want to understand. And uh, the second um, theme, and all of these were connected in all the publications, uh, are about the cultural considerations of global findings. So obviously because, because there are two different countries, um, there are differences in terms of, you know, socioeconomical differences and values and, um, you know, the own context of living. So there are two uh, different, clear differences there. So that's an important theme that emerged from all the publications. And finally, the blue bit is, like the contribution to the topic, that is there is a need for explicit teaching of emotional intelligence in pre-service teachers. They really want to know, first year students, they really want to know and they're sure they're gonna learn about it in their degree. So they said like 60 something percent said, yes, I will learn about it. I'm sure it will be covered um, and I'll be ready to teach students and I'll be, um, you know, I'll have the strategies to control my emotions when I get upset, for example. Whereas fourth year students have said, no, the topic wasn't covered. Um, I wish I had learned more. I think I revised this in um, the psychology units, but it's not enough. So yeah, obviously there's a gap here and this is the main problem. How can we incorporate these um, um, skills or set of skills in, in the degree? So the discussion, uh, the final discussion of the whole thesis, I'm summarizing the best I can, uh, is that um, EI, I will say EI, emotional intelligence, at this point in time, um, is perceived by these participants only 
in this study as the theory construct. They know the theory, they understand the theory, um, and, and this involved their expectations, perceptions, and views about the topic. And the data in general uh, clearly show um, and documented um, PSTs, uh, pre-service teachers, uh, the theory, but the um, the practice, um, the you know, the set of skills is lacking. So, in general, to answer the research research question, how is EI understood, enacted, and embedded in initial teacher education? In these two um, particular contexts, there are two ways. One is about the theory as a framework where they can understand, they can explain what it is, they can show the perceptions, they can provide definitions, and they can tell you about the importance of EI, uh, obviously depending on the context. And then on the other hand, you have the practice as a framework. And here is the how, the how they can learn and learn about it and how can they implement strategies is like lacking. And um, here they talk about the skills and strategies to, um, you know, teach this in the classroom and to manage their own emotions. Uh, but where is it? Where, where, is, where is this training? It's lacking, right? So finally, I kind of um, identified the gap. Where is the gap here? So in the middle, EI con construct for te teacher education is combined by two different things. What you know about what you're teaching, the subject expertise, for example, if you're teaching maths or biology or language or whatever you're teaching, plus the learning, and teaching methods, how you teach it, right? Um, but EI is sort of sitting in the middle. You can know a lot about um, how to teach the topic, and you can know a lot about the topic itself. But what what ha what's happening, and I don't know in, in, in your context, but how do you get to manage and, and, and to understand your emotions when you're frustrated, for example, or when you get... Uh, so much work to do and uh, where is that support right so research says that we get burned out quite easily because of the demands of the teaching profession so in general and summarizing the topic um, my research uh, provided an understanding of the processes by which uh, pre-service students and the ones who design the degree understand the role and place of emotional intelligence in teacher education. So I provided evidence for the need to include topics such, uh, such as emotional competence, emotional education programs, social emotional skills in both as part of the core units or professional development in pre-service teacher course degree. And also this study um, sought to understand the lack of available knowledge uh, of EI. And obviously this is also something that has been researched in the past, but not in this particular context. So the need is, is there and, and you know, um, uh, the, the, the study itself provided new insights uh, about where EI is, you know, um, positioned according to university officials and curriculum leaders. Uh, so it can be, you know, can impact and introduce, uh, hopefully, programs that can help supporting these issues. All right, so that's the main um, summary. And very in very simple words, just to make it look nice. And I don't know if you have any questions about the poster. And, and the final comment that I, I, I would like to share with you about this topic, and there are some resources there you want, in case you want to learn more about it, you can copy it and paste them, or you can just type them or, or Google them. Um, so we have no cho choice but to recognize the emotional contours of teaching and learning. So ignoring those dim dimensions won't make them go away, 
right? So in learning and teaching, emotions are ever present and ignoring or suppressing those emotions harm students and teachers alike. So that's the final message that I want to convey out there, that there's a need to understand and to support future teachers. And I guess uh, while you're studying in your degree is where you feel more passionate, more into changing different things. So that's why I decided to do pre-service teachers and not already teachers who are out there in the classroom. All right, so those are the references you want in case you want to search for the topic a bit more. And before I move on, do you have any questions about that that you would like to ask before I move on? I have a question, but I will let others to use this opportunity to ask your question better than me, I think. Please, uh, for other students, do you have question so far? Bapak dan Ibu, ada pertanyaan? Boleh? Okay, looks like there's no one uh, wants to ask the question, but um, I'm interested uh, by what you say you do the publication by chopping the data, like based on the categorized survey or other data you have, but is that, is that correct? By What do you mean? Like uh, you use your different type of data for your publication, right? You said? Yes. How how you can do that? Like rather than taking for from all the the finding together from all the data. Uh, yeah. So what I basically did, um, the first thing I did is that to frame the study, to frame what I was doing, I wrote a autoethnography, which is like um, it's not a um a biography. Uh, it's more about the choices of me doing this. Uh, so I talk about my childhood. It's kind of um, an easy reading. So I'll, I can share that in the chat if you want to read something that is quite, um, it's quite personal though. <laughs> but it's good for students to, to read it because they might understand why I decided to do this and why I, I, I want to help teachers, right? Um, so I did that, which is the autoethnography, and the data was my own story. I collected photographs, I interviewed my uh, family members, my ex-classmates, I collected newspapers, and it took me ages, like two years to do that paper. And uh, after that, I decided to do a survey. So I compared first year students and fourth year students, and that was one publication, right? So I had the data there and that, got, that was published in 2019. And the third publication, it was about um, the same survey, but in Chile. So I compared uh, first years and fourth year students uh, in there. And the final publication was about these two course leaders. So I sort of did it, I did it step by step. So as I was collecting the data, I was analyzing the data and I was writing the publication at the same time. So a lot of things combined. And after I, I had four publications, uh, two are under review still. Uh, I sort of did this wheel where I found all the themes and all the connections. And that's how I wrote the discussion chapter. Okay, really cool. Thank you for your answer. That's all right. Any okay, other questions? Okay, yeah? can I? Okay. You sure. I'm here. Hello, Okta. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, uh, Miss Ade, thank you for the time for the MC. And Miss Marcella, hello, good afternoon, Miss. It's here, afternoon in Indonesia. Okay. Miss Marcella here to say, my name is Okta Pratama Putra. Now I'm currently a student of UNJ, State University of Jakarta. You know what? Talking about publication, it is very important thing that I have to follow, I have to join, because my lecture demand me to do that publication. 
Of course, it's about the requirement of the subject here in my lecture. What I mean, I have no idea about kind of publication, for example, like Scopus, Thomson Reuters, Thomson Reuter, also or, um, Copernicus. My question is, could you please um, show me or what is it, explain me about, sorry, explain to me about which one is, uh, has the higher position of the rating, for example, like Scopus publication, Thomson, Copernicus, or something like that, miss. That's it, miss. All right. Thank <laughs> you for your question, Okta. Um, sure. I think that would depend on your university. In our mm. case, we had a list of preferred published journals. Mm. So mm. it's not like we had the chance to pick any journal. We had an Excel file where you could find the journals and that was the tricky point because the, it wasn't compulsory, but they were kind of expecting that we as PhD students were publishing in, in prestigious articles, right? Mm. Um, so in that case, I would just ask your supervisors to let you know mm. what are the preferred journals. Mm. In my case, how, how I did it, um, I wanted to publish the first article, the autoethnography, in a very high-rated art journal, and that was a Q1. And um, I think I got lucky, or I don't know, but <laughs> well, mm. not actually lucky because I had to rewrite it. I don't know how many times, and fin it finally got published, uh, and it was part of this list of preferred journals that the university was asking so i'm um, that was a match and then the second addict the second journal um i think i found it from that list um but it's it wasn't that hard to get it published there why because the data was about australian students mm -hmm. and the journal was called australian teacher of education, something like that, I forgot now, but it's about Australia. So it matched perfectly fine. And then the other two got really challenging because <laughs> the Chilean data is super specific. It's like, who wants to learn about that? Okay, so what are the journals that I can publish there? And there are not so many, uh, there are like three or four. So the chances are, less and that's why it's taking me so much time to get it published because big journals don't really want to know about this specific little country <laughs> and they keep rejecting it so uh, by now I just want to dig it <laughs> no I'm joking it's under review but it's like a constant process of getting rejections and sometimes you get it right sometimes you don't but it's it's a tiring process and um i i guess the first to get the first one out once you do that maybe it's gonna be less difficult in the future hmm. i see um, yeah Ms. okay Thank you uh, for your information, Dr. Gallardo. Here in Indonesia, we are um, what have uh, the common, like, I don't know we, what we call that, but Scopus is kind of like the major um, oh. index for the reputable journal in Indonesia. So that's mm. why we mentioned most, uh, like it is, it in influences how we, uh, we build the targeted journal here. It's quite different uh, with what we do in international uh, perspective. Like we, we are based on what uh, the theme of the journal, is it the right place to publish? But uh, back to our university also, we also, uh, we, we maybe used like, is it ranked by Scopus or not as the kind of like requirement or a priority first uh, to, to choose the, the journal? That's, that's maybe uh, what I can say from uh, the Octa's question here. Okay, Mr. Thanks for your additional info, yeah.
the point is back on me. Yeah. I need to read more. I need to doing. Sorry, I need to do research more about having more inspiration. And finally, I try to what is it? Publish on reputable journal. So it start and it ends by me. Thank you for your time, Miss Marcel and Miss Andy. <clears throat> Thank you for asking. Um, yeah. So you sort of walked us to the final part of my presentation today and I, hopefully you'll have a lot of questions i'm happy to answer anything um so yeah the publication bit is one one big thing that you do in a phd in a master's degree as well i mean um you can get publications done when when you're doing a master's degree I I think when I did my bachelor's degree, I tried to publish my minor thesis. Um, but because I was in the bachelor's degree, it felt something like for, like, I don't know, like pre prestigious lecturers. <laughs> I didn't want to keep trying. I was young as well. But when you do a PhD, there's no way out. I mean, some students don't do any publications in, in, in the while they are doing the PhD, but that that can that can be harder later on once you finish your PhD because you have more time to write, right? Which means that you can postpone it and it gets harder to get it done. Um, so I guess um, in my case, having my supervisors to talk to me about publications and to encourage me to get my work published and to, um, uh, you know, sort of explain to me why we need to get publications and to find, you know, high, uh, ranked in journals and that was um I, I i don't know if i would have done it without them to be honest uh, so I, my one piece of advice for me would be to really trust your supervisors if you have any and ask them as many questions as you like there are quite a few workshops here that i did here at monash that helped me decided to do a phd by publications which is um, a little bit different to a normal uh, traditional PhD. So with a traditional PhD, you write your thesis um, with um, chapters like introduction, you know, lead review and findings and results and then discussion. Whereas a PhD by publication, you do, um, you do have like exegesis. That's why we call the first, chapter like to introduce the topic and to provide the rationale and the lead review etc cetera, etc cetera. but as I said before each of the finding chapters for me was a, a publication so yes it was hard because I was doing two things at the same time I was writing my PhD I was collecting data but I was doing all the skills together like I collected the data I analyzed the data I wrote the journal articles and then quickly, you need to send it. And here in, at Monash, it's a requirement that if you do a PhD by publication, you need to get at least one publication published before you submit your thesis. So the pressure is high. I would say that at some point in my third year, I wanted to give up. I just wanted to withdraw. It was just too much. I didn't want to keep going. So you go through a roller coaster, like, oh, like this is too hard. But once you get the very first one done, um, you feel like, okay, it's not too bad. And you can keep working on the others. But it, it's like, you really have to be persistent and push yourself and keep reading articles and keep taking notes. And so there are several skills to do publications. It's just not about reading and taking notes. It's more about analyzing the, the reading and critically engaging um, with the literature and then comparing with your own data. Uh, and getting rejections is part of the process. 
you are very like, oh, okay, you submit the article and then you're like super hopeful and you really want to get that published. And then when you read the comments from the reviewers, <laughs> they kill you alive. They peel your skin off their harsh, harsh comments. But I would say that it's actually great to have that harsh feedback because they are looking at your study from outside and they are doing this very critically. Um, they're really trying to let you know what are the things you need to change? What are the things that are not clear? What are you missing in your article? And then you can take that feedback and add it to your article. And that's the most difficult thing because you've been reading it so many times and writing it for so long that once, once you read that, those feedback, you're like, oh, I really want to just submit it somewhere else and I won't do any changes. But the highly thing to happen is that you might get another rejection <laughs> um, because you didn't do any changes. So. I would say it's um, it's very important that um, you take that feedback on board um, and don't take it personally because um, that's very common too. Um, I, I, I think the first rejection I had, I cried. <laughs> I was crying because it took me so long, so long to get it done, to write the article. And because it was so personal, so close to home, so close to my own personal experiences that I felt like judged, like, I don't know. But then after a while, I, I, I had some time off away from the article. I read the feedback again and I thought, okay, I think I can, I can redo it. And I worked for, I don't know how many months after that, I, I kind of rewrote it and it got published. So it's it's a matter of taking the feedback more to, you know, don't take it personally and keep trying, keep trying and resubmit and resubmit. There's one article that I don't know how many times I have sent it to publication, like five times to different journal articles. And I keep changing what they're saying and, and still there. <laughs> It's still not out there, but I, I'm confident that one day, maybe, maybe it will get, it will get published. But I don't want, I don't want to waste all that work, because it, it's, and I've seen it from my, um, my colleagues at the university. They just dig it. They just, okay, it got rejected. I don't want to see it anymore. And you've been, you, you spent so much time collecting that data and writing it and polishing it, then then you just leave it there. I think it's a waste of time. You can always try somewhere else and change something or add something. And that's the thing because you wait for so long to get feedback. I actually waited like 10 months for an article and they finally said, no, I think it's not suitable for the journal. And I was like, why didn't you tell me earlier? Like I could have done something different or send it somewhere else. And yes, in those 10 months, there are new studies that you need to add. So you have to go back to, <laughs> to the data and change uh, whatever you didn't include there because then they're going to judge you. Like why didn't you use articles that are now um, out there and you didn't include them so yeah it can be tricky but it's worth the process does anyone else have any questions Anyone else? Maybe about studying overseas. Um, 
does anyone here want to study somewhere else? I know it's tricky these days because we're all uh, living the not dream with the <laughs> pandemic. So it can get, you know, quite a bit um, challenging. But uh, anyone else? Silakan Bapak Ibu yang lain. Bapak Ibu ada yang mau bertanya silakan. So is it to uh, Marcella? Do, do you have any more slides, or this is the end of the? No, this is the end. Um, I don't know if anyone else um want to ask anything else about I don't know studying overseas or um obviously I I didn't include anything about how to get published because I think that's something that would depend on each of the universities um I don't know if what we do here at Monash um sort of applies to the university there because it doesn't apply to my university back home so it depends on the context yeah that's very right and then um, it is not really that new but we have in indonesia now the requirement for postgraduate program students uh, need to publish at least one article uh, in the reputable journal and then as i said before usually we use scopus as the uh, index for the reputable one which is i know it doesn't right uh doesn't being applied in uh, international perspective because usually uh, more look like the theme and then the, the rank by seeing the quality of the journal, but it's quite different here. And then uh, I'm trying to give uh, like broader perspective about this journal index here yeah, with the student. And then, yeah, it is. So basically all the student doing the, this is with, uh, by publication here at least they, they need to publish one either in the uh, doctoral degree because uh, here in Indonesia we have the mini thesis as the requirement also and then uh, different level of publication but the master student also need to do publication that's the situation for the student here in 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 our university Universitas Negeri Jakarta it sounds like very difficult <laughs> So. You poor students. Well, um, I think it, it has like pros and cons. The pro is that you get the skill learned and done when you are studying, whereas some students do it after they finish their degree because it's not compulsory. But then it can take so long. Like you can just spend so much time looking at journals and looking at what is that you're going to write about and it, the time keeps keeps you know um flying and then you don't get anything done um so i guess it's not too bad that you are forced um to to complete at least one publication so um 
it will be good for you to have that in your CV, academic CV as well. All right, so does anyone else have any other or last questions? Um, anything else you would like to ask? Silakan Bapak Ibu. Ada yang mau bertanya dibuka kembali oleh Ibu Marcela kesempatan untuk yang mau bertanya. Pada diem banget ya. Oke, tidak ada pertanyaan lagi. Gimana? Oh, ini ada Ika Supeti. Silahkan, Mbak Ika. I think Ika has a question. Okay, good afternoon. Sorry for not opening my video because I have a signal issue here. Good. Okay, I want to ask you about uh, maybe literature review. Yes, right. literature review. Uh, do you have any suggestion for us to choose uh, how to arrange the literature review? Is it should be from the same journal, same kind of journal, or we can pick from many kind of journal? All Thank right. You. That. Thank you for your question, Ika. Yeah. So how I did it, in my case, what I did, it was very strategic. So I wanted to make sure that I was including the literature that was relevant for the topic, of course. So you have to make sure that you're citing all the ones, all the big names and all the big research, like main important bits. But I also, what I did, whenever I wanted to publish at some journal, I looked my topic quickly in that journal. You know, there's always like um, like a search kind of area. And then I clicked there, for example, emotional intelligence in free service teachers. So I checked all the keywords related to the topic and I added all those previous uh, studies in my article. So the reviewers kind of see, they can see that I took the time to read whatever they have in their journals. So it's kind of, it's, it's a bit more academic as well. Um, so that's one strategy. And the other strategy that I did, I created a very simple word file where I had um, author, year, um, methodology, and then main findings in my words. Why in my words? Because then it's easier for me to paraphrase in my own article without plagiarizing. Uh, so I didn't have to go back to the article because I already had my own understandings or whatever it is that I read. So I can include them in the, in, in the, in the journal that I was writing. Um, but yeah, um, you definitely have to look at, you know, the main, main big names and, and topics that are out there in, in like peer reviewed articles, right? And books and, um, and we use um, Monash database and there's like, like um, section where you select uh, peer reviewed journals. So we, we can only use those because you know, it's more rigorous. Um, and I did this sort of thing, like I searched for the, um, if my topic was included as part of the journal. And that's the first thing you need to know about getting your work published in a search of journal. If there's nothing about whatever you're writing, then definitely they're not gonna publish it there. <laughs> that's simple. They're not interested. Um, so make sure there's something related um, in there. How did you do it, Ami, when you were writing your publications? Yeah, I do the kind of like 
shopping all the literature first and then classify which one I will use or not. And then even like, because I have also specific theoretical framework, so somehow it's going to be more like narrow than bringing all the topics together. So it being selected with the readings also help you to really make a concise writing, I guess, rather than put everything together in your writing. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, if, yeah, obviously you need to narrow it down. Otherwise, you're going to have like a thousand names in there and it's, you don't have the words. Uh, that's the tricky thing. You have like little amount of words to uh, write your lead review section. So, yeah, um, I'm just reading a question there. Uh, that's okay. I assume Monash University is not compulsory to publish one article in national or international. Um, yes, it is compulsory. Uh, you have to. When you're doing a PhD by publication, you have to have one published um, or accepted, I think. I think accept, but it's kind of the same thing. If they accept you, your paper is because it's going to get published, right? But yes, you have to have one uh, article published in a national journal or international journal. At least that's at Monash. And if you select the journal from this Excel file they provided, that's even better because then you are sort of... Um, Ticking the box. Um, so it was a bit easier in that case because you had the whole list there. Um, so you can select any journal from there. But I usually used um, Simago um, to select for the QR, the QR, <laughs> the Q factor and then, you know, index. So that was a bit easier and summarized. The only thing is that not all the journals are there. And it gets a bit tricky to find uh, what is what is the Q number. Uh, it is also compulsory for master's degree. Uh, when I did my master, it wasn't compulsory, and that is because my master was by coursework, so you are not required to write an article. Um, you can, you can write it once you finish your minor thesis, but it's like not part of the degree. You know, you can do it later and they highly encourage you to do it, but it's like free, free choice. You can do it or you cannot. Uh, there's another master, which is master by research. And I think that's a different story there. I am not quite sure if you need to get at least one published, but it sounds like by the name, <laughs> you should. Um, I don't know if you know about that, Ami. No, I haven't got any experience about the uh, doing the master there. And then I heard that uh, you're just doing the, th the mini thesis as a part of kind of like assignment. But we have here again, back to Indonesia, we have the face-to-face -face meeting and then we have the thesis as the compulsory requirement for finishing the master degree. So quite same with the PhD, because PhD also have a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting like a class. And then and, uh, at the end of the uh, semester four, I think it uh, will be continued by doing the thesis as a PhD student. And then shorter for the master student, that's the type we have here in Indonesia in our university. Yeah, yeah. Um... At Monash, it is compulsory if you do a thesis by publication. If you do it a traditional thesis, it's not compulsory. Um, it's up to you. You can do it later on. But if you are, if you decided to do by publication, yes, you need to get at least one published. And if you have more than one, obviously it's better because then when you have the reviewers looking at your work, you get little, little comments like. Um, they won't sort of judge you a lot because you already had how many reviewers in each of your publications, like two or three. And if you have two or three publications, it's like you have 
six or five, like who is gonna judge that? Like, so yeah. Yes, it's very tricky tricky in our situation, I know, because I still have one more waiting uh, for final decision for, for my PhD article. And then it's been like more than one year, almost two years, but still waiting. Oh, yeah, that's right. And I don't feel like I want to look at them anymore. It feels like um, I think like I finished my PhD and that's all done. I don't want to. <laughs> but I don't want to waste all the work uh, uh, as well. So I might get, um, um, I might meet my supervisors again to see how can we fix those publications. And it's good for them too. You know, they get <laughs> promotions and those kind of things when they get publications done. True. And yes, Ibulili, there are two streams uh, in Monash, even like the traditional one, it's not pretty popular anymore. Most of the supervisors now direct the student or guide the student to choose the publication one, I think. Okay, do you still have time, uh, Dr. Gallardo? I have a few minutes in case there's one more question. Okay, that's really nice. We will have maybe one more question from uh, all the participants. Please maybe raise hand or unmute yourself to ask question to Dr. Gallardo here. If not, maybe I want to use this opportunity because we are not really sharing our uh, research uh, that deep. Uh, Excuse well. me, Miss. Oh, there's okay. someone here. Me again, Okta. Oh, Okta. Okay. Please. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the time, Miss Marcella and Miss Adil Utami. Yeah. It is about my experience about how to write a journal, how to write an article. What I mean? For the few days, we only need about writing an article only. What I mean, we don't have to use our software, for example, like Mendeley operation and plagiarism checker. That's for the past day. But I mean, for the time being, for the sorry, time has changed, it needs more about the requirement to have two more technical right, the technical problem of um, using Mendeley and plagiarism. For example, like when I use the plagiarism checking. It is about how to write differently between the other articles, right? What I mean, I try to use my own word, my own hypothesis or my own sentences. But when I check by using that plagiarism, it's detected. It has detected, it has the same word for the other journal. What I mean, oh my God, it's really my own word, my own mind from what is it doing my research and how can I what is it? Um, I revised that. From my teacher said, Ofta, you need to paraphrase it. Or you need to, what is it? Move the sentence backward, forward. Of course, yes, it is missed. I have already done about paraphrasing, move it, move on. But you know what? It has not decreased the similarity. What I mean, it's very hard to make it different, but we have different context, miss. Then how can I defend my argument, my writing about Sorry, without no paraphrasing, that's it. Yeah, I think that's um, a very good question. And I can refer you to some resources. Um, one of the jobs I did at Monash, I was providing academic support and, um, you know, not only in academic English structure, but also in um, how they convey the meaning of what they try to say. And we use here a sub, um, kind of program which is called Turnitin. So we can get to see um, who are the students who are plagiarizing. And it's a high offense at university level. You can get, you know, you can get a zero if they caught you um, cheating or using someone else's work. So, um, 
one of the strategies that I use to, to write my own work and to reflect on 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 what I what I want what, what I was understanding what I was reading, um, and I'll copy a link um, in the chat so you can refer to that later before I forget. Um, so whenever I was writing and uh, reading an article, um, I had, you know, there's like a, a wide little space next to you. I'm very old fashioned and I know it's not very eco-friendly, but whenever I find a very important journal, I print it out. Um, if it's really gonna make my work uh, better, I just printed that one or two or three not every single thing you read, of course, just the main ones. And then you can, what I do, I take notes on the side with my own understanding, my own, what is that I understand from the reading. And then I use that bit and then I add an in-text citation after I write that. So I didn't quite write anything without adding an in-text citation. If you do that, then you're not plagiarizing, unless you're giving your opinion. And then you can use words such as, uh, let me, I'll quickly show you a very, are you right? I guess you're not writing in English, right? Are you writing in, publishing in Indonesian? Using Indonesian language? Maybe in the future we can uh, from because now uh, Marcela, I I'm in charge for uh, for the unit that um, responsible for public research and publication kind of that and then we will have about uh, that we will have in the future like uh, this specific topic about avoiding plagiarism. I already said uh, just click uh, what you wrote in avoiding plagiarism. Maybe from that reading, we can build more session on that in the future. It's going to be really helpful for other students as well. So very interesting uh, with the question. And then you raise uh, another topic for our discussion in the future. Yeah, I think it's really important and it's hard to nail. It's really hard to nail. I I, I was teaching um, pre-service teachers here in Australia. They are 99% domestic students, like local students, and they really have a hard time trying to paraphrase um, and turn it in score goes up to the sky. And we can tell, we can read where is that they took from. So whatever you copy and paste anything that is not from your brain and you put it in your work, that's plagiarism. If you are rewriting it, rewording it and write it in your own words, academically, of course, and then you add the in-text citation next to whatever you said, you're not plagiarizing. You're actually citing the, the people who said that. I prefer in-text citations rather than quotes. I only use quotes when I'm using a definition or when I cannot change the meaning of what they are saying, when I don't want to change the meaning because it's their words. Then I use quotes. But most of the time, probably 89%, I use paraphrasing. And there's a very good website, which I'll show you in a minute. And I'll put it in the chat as well. Um, it's about uh, using academic language. So I know maybe now you're not writing in English, but you can get some ideas and then just translate them maybe. So when, in, when you are referring to sources and then you click the top there, you can get some ideas like general comments on relevant literature, uh, previous research, and then you can use, you know, you have many examples on how to insert in-text citations. So this is more about the language itself, uh, but I think it's really useful, especially when you want to be critical. And then you can click at anything there. There are so many different um, examples, right? Um, uh, okay, so can you give an example? Yes, um, I don't know how many, um, what's the, what's the referencing style they use there? 
Is it APA? We have uh, APA. Okay. Um, I'll share another link, which is very much friendly. Okay, so I'll share another link, which is like um, a bit kind of general guidelines on how to use IPA 7th. You can download a quick guide, and I highly recommend you to do that because then you get um, like the summary of the whole thing. So you can in, add in-text citations, and if you click there, you have like all the examples on how you can do it, but you basically explain whatever um, someone else is saying, and then you add the in-text citations as for this one. I usually recommend students to use the primary source and avoid using as cited as, because it means you're not reading the primary source. Um, I would just use Smith um, 12, 2012, and then you have to find the main, yes. it's painful. Um, but I think it's, yeah, it's worth it. Yes, in the future, um, uh, dear uh, participants, we, we uh, the GAD, the unit gonna launch the not 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 GAD, but uh, under Maskarisda itu nanti dari pasca sarjana uh, akan melaunch uh, pedoman penyelesaian studi yang di dalamnya nanti juga ada aturan pengutipan dan penulisan tesis. Jadi memang uh, akan berbeda dengan secara umum uh, format-format yang ada di di dunia internasional. Memang yang diikuti nanti akan yang ada di pasca sarjana saja. Jadi ibu dan bapak mengarahnya acuan yang kita pergunakan tetap EPA seperti yang disampaikan Bu Marcela, tapi nanti mungkin ada spesifikasinya akan lebih jelas tunggu nanti di launch sama program pasca sarjana. Oke? Okay? So Marcela, we have a kind of like guidelines uh, for writing a PhD thesis and all all the regulation here in our doctor. Uh, postgraduate program and we can launch it maybe soon like within this month or next month uh, it's oh. based on APA and but we have other requirements that may be slightly different with uh, the, in the international uh, perspective that's maybe uh, I just announced to the student uh, for uh, like checking whether like the, the where you, you you posted about the referencing with APA with uh, later we have to look back on, in our own regulation in the university. All right, that sounds good. Okay, we okay. I have to go now, but okay. um, I'll pop my email just in case anyone would like to send me an email with a question. I'm happy to share links um, and to share my experience if you really feel like you want to study overseas or if you want to do PhD by publication or whatever it is. Uh, I might take a little time to answer, but I will do so. <laughs> That's Thank really you so much for having me today. And I hope that was a bit, a bit useful. Yes. So, Bapak dan Ibu, uh, it's really nice uh, for uh, Dr. Kalarda here share the email. So, if you want to have, uh, uh, if you want to ask more question or asking about taking PhD overseas, you, you can uh, directly email her uh, in Monash. Okay. Again, thank you, Dr. Masala. We have the certificate from our university. I will uh, send it to you uh, uh, soon after this event. And again, uh, uh, I do really hope we can do more session in the future about research and publication. That's really kind of like uh, kind of like support system that I uh, we try to build here for the postgraduate student in our university. All right. Good luck, everyone. And okay. keep on with the Thank good you. work. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Happy writing. Not a problem. Bye-bye. See you.